One of the important tools that the bounty hunters use in Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep is a test that is supposed to tell humans apart from androids and therefore allow the bounty hunters to, with great confidence, in fact, you know, almost 100% confidence, say that this, this thing is an android and can be retired or killed, and this is a person and we cannot do that to it. And there's a lot of use of this test within the novel itself, much more than we see in the film adaptation, The Blade Runner, where it's uh, used early on replicating um, at least one main, we could call it, vignette within the novel itself, which we'll talk about briefly, the testing of Rachel Rosen. And what we see here is um, early in chapter three, Rick is, is uh, talking about tests, right? No intelligence test would, would trap such a Andy as the new Nexus six is. But then again, intelligence tests hadn't trapped an Andy in years, not since the primordial crude varieties of the 1970s. The Nexus six Android types, Rick reflected, surpassed several classes of human specials, that is uh, humans whose brains have devolved in certain ways in terms of intelligence. In other words, androids equipped with the new Nexus 6 brain unit had, from a sort of rough, pragmatic, no-nonsense standpoint, evolved beyond a major but inferior segment of mankind for better or worse. The servant had, in some cases, become more adroit than its master. That's the dilemma going on. But new scales of achievement, for example, the voight camp empathy test, had emerged as a criteria by which to judge. An android, no matter how gifted as to pure intellectual capacity, could make no sense out of the fusion, which took place routinely among the followers of mercerism, uh, an experience which he, Deckard, and virtually everyone else, including subnormal chicken heads, managed with no difficulty. Now, it's not actually measuring the fusion as such, although androids don't understand mercerism, it's measuring the kinds of responses. And we see this discussed at the end of chapter four, where there's a little bit of exposition. Rachel says, I've never seen an empathy test being administered. What are these things that you have there measure? And then we get some info dumping. Rick said this, he held up the flat adhesive disc with its trailing wires, measures capillary dilation in the facial area. We know this to be a primary autonomic response, the so-called shame or blushing reaction to a morally shocking stimulus. It can't be controlled voluntarily as can skin, conductivity, respiration, and cardiac rate. He showed her the other instrument, a pencil, pencil beam light. This records fluctuations of tension within the eye muscles. Simultaneous with the blush phenomenon, there can generally be found, found a small but detectable movement of, and then she interrupts, and these can't be found in androids. Now here he says something really interesting. They're not engendered by the stimuli, stimuli questions. No, although biologically they exist, potentially. So what we've got here is a fairly simple test, which is measuring responses, shame or embarrassment or uh, other you know, negative emotion responses to questions. And the questions are deliberately designed to evoke emotional responses. And this is intended to measure empathy. Now, before we go on and look at the book, think about some of the implications of this. Can we really measure in all cases what a person's emotional reactions are, or even sufficiently in these sorts of matters. There are some interesting implications given the diversity of humankind. And we're going to see that this, this does present certain problems. But the questions themselves are going to prove very interesting as well. And we notice that there's, so there's this apparatus to the test. And then there's another element, you could say, that comes up. Uh, it's assessed using the voight camp altered scale. And you might say, altered? Why is it altered? Well, as we find out, uh, camp, here we go, 
Um, there's a discussion going on that we're going to get to in, in just a moment about what the scale is measuring. And um, here we go. Rick says, the consensus of police opinion is known to you in Lurie Camps. There's the camp of the Voight Camp Test article written eight years ago, role taking blockage um, in the undeteriorated schizophrenic. Camp compared the diminished empathetic faculty found in human mental patients and a superficially similar, but basically, and then they, they go on as well. So the test was altered, or not the test, but rather the interpretation of the test was altered um, in order to, to tune it up. And these tests go through a series of um, improvements and modifications. They're always, it's sort of like a back and forth technological war. The Rosen Corporation is trying to make androids that are better and better and better, including able to pass these tests or not to be detected, you could say, by these tests. And actually at the very um, end of the discussion, uh, in in uh, um, uh, chapter uh, 16, when Rachel, the android, and Rick have been um, together in a hotel room. Um, so she, she says, you know, um, why did Eldon and the other Rosens, the human ones, wh why did they want me to go along with you? And so he says, to observe to detail exactly what the Nexus 6 does that gives it away on the Voight Camp test. And then she says, on the test or otherwise, everything that gives it a different quality. And then I report back, and the association makes modifications of its zygote bath DNS factors. And then we have the Nexus 7, the, the newest Android yet to come. And when that gets cut, we modify again. And eventually the association has a type that can't be Distinguish. And he asks her about another test. Do you know about the Bonelli reflex arc test, he asked? And she said, we're working on the spinal ganglia too. Someday the Bonelli test will fade into yesterday's hoary shroud of spiritual oblivion. Right? And so what we've got here is a corporation that off-world is trying to subvert and defeat these tests. And now that's a good lead-in to thinking about the concerns about the Voight Camp test. What are the concerns? Well, what if a human doesn't pass the test? And this comes up in sort of a hypothetical way early on in a discussion between uh, Deckard and, and Bryant, right? So this, this is in that um, passage that we were looking at from chapter four. And he says, um, this is a Bryant when you run the Voight Camp scale up there, if one of the humans fails to pass it, Rick says, that, that can't happen. And then Brian says, well, one day a few weeks ago, I talked with Dave, the other bounty hunter, about exactly that. He'd been thinking along the same lines. I had a memo from the Soviet police, WPO itself, circulated throughout Earth plus the colonies. A group of psychiatrists in Leningrad have approached WPO with the following proposition. They want the latest and most accurate personality profile analytical tools used in determining the presence of an android. In other words, the Voight Camp scale applied to a carefully selected group of schizoid and schizophrenic human patients. Those specifically which reveal what's called the flattening of affect. You've heard of that. And then Rick says, well, that's specifically what the scale measures. So there's a, there's a problem. Um, you know, different, pe different types of mental disorders could lead to the flattening of affect that then could lead to being misjudged on the test as not being human, not having the proper empathetic responses and therefore being an android. And he goes on and he says, the Leningrad psychiatrists think that a small class of human beings could not pass the Voight Camp scale. If you tested them in line with police work, you'd assess them as humanoid robots. You'd be wrong, but by then they'd be dead. And so that would be a major problem. And so Rick says, but those individuals, and then Brian says, well, they'd be in institutions. They couldn't conceivably function in the outside world. They certainly couldn't go undetected as advanced psychotics. 
Unless, of course, their breakdown had come recently and suddenly and no one had gotten around to noticing. But this could happen. And uh, then he, he goes on and he says, what worried Dave is the appearance of this new Nexus 6 advanced type. The Rosen organization assured us, as you know, a Nexus 6 could be delineated by standard profile tests. We took their word for it, but those slippery bastards, right? He, he's going on. They, they've tricked us in, in many respects. He says, um, now we're forced to determine it on our own. That's what you'll be doing in Seattle at the Rosen Corporation. You understand, don't you? This could go wrong either way. There's kind of a dilemma here, right? If you apply the test and a human being fails the test, well, that's one kind of problem. If you apply the test and a Nexus 6 Android passes the test, now we've got a separate problem. In either case, the test would be invalidated, right? Um, he says, uh, um, it would be awkward, though no one, not, not even the Rosen people, will make the news public. We'd be able to sit on it indefinitely, though we'd have to inform WPO, and they in turn would uh, notify Leningrad, and, and this would be a massive problem. So what do we find? Um, he goes to the Rosen Corporation, and... Um, you know, he's going back and forth with Eldon and Rachel Rosen, and Rachel's asking about the test. And then she says, give me the test. And Rick says, why? And then Eldon Rosen, the head of the corporation, says, we selected her as your first subject. She may be an android. We're hoping you can tell. So they give the test to Rachel. And here we should you know, look at the questions that are being asked because that gives us an idea how they're evoking the emotional responses. We're going to see similar questions with Luba Luft uh, a little bit later. So what are the questions? He says, um, I'm going to outline a number of social situations. You are to express your reaction to each as quickly as possible. You're going to be timed. And she says, of course, my verbal responses won't count. It's solely the eye muscle and capillary reaction you'll use as indices. But I'll answer. I want to go through with this. Go ahead, Mr. Deckart. So here's the first question. You're given a calfskin wallet on your birthday. She says, I wouldn't accept it. Also, I'd report the person who gave it to, uh, gave it to me to the police. Now, why? Because calfskin wallets are totally illegal. You have to kill a calf. You have to kill a living <clears throat> animal, which would show a lack of empathy, in order to, to derive that. So even the products of that should evoke a kind of emotional reaction. He uh, continues on to the eighth question. You have a little boy, and he shows you his butterfly collection, including his killing jar. Uh, a little bit later, you're sitting watching TV, and suddenly you discover a wasp crawling on your wrist. And here she says... I'd kill it. Now that's an interesting reaction, right? In a magazine, you come across a full page color picture of a nude girl. And she says, is this testing whether I'm an android or whether I'm homosexual? He continued her, your husband likes the picture. The girl is lying face down on a large and beautiful bearskin rug. There's, there's the payoff, right? It's, it's uh, uh, once again, measuring responses to animal products or cruelty or things like that. Now, they go on, uh, and, and he talks about um, ordering lobster, the chef dropping the lobster into the tub of boiling water, while the characters in this novel watch. Um, they go again, you rent a mountain cabin in an area still verdant. It's rustic, knotty pine with a huge fireplace. On the walls, someone has hung old maps, courier and eye prints, and above the fireplace, a deer's head has been mounted, a full stag with developed horns. The people with you admire the decor of the cabin, and you all decide, you know, and then she gives her response. Here's another. Um, you become pregnant by a man who has promised to marry you. The man goes off with another woman, your best friend. You get an abortion. And the, she says, I would never get an abortion. You can't. The, it's a life sentence. The police are watching. And um, here's, he says, one more. You're dating a man, and he asks you to visit his apartment. While you're there, he offers you a drink. 
As you stand holding your glass, you see into the bedroom. It's attractively de decorated with bullfight posters, and you wander in to look closer. He follows after you, closing the door, putting his arm around you, he says, and then she says, what's a bullfight poster? Drawings, usually in color and very large, showing a matador with his cape, a bull trying to gore him. And he says, you know, do you know how bullfights ended? The bull was always killed. And then he says, a final question, two part. You're watching an, an old movie on TV, a movie from before the war. It shows a banquet in progress. The guests are enjoying live oysters. She says, ugh. And then the entree, he continued, consists of boiled dog stuffed with rice. And then he asks her, are raw oysters more acceptable to you than a dish of boiled dog? Evidently not. And he comes to the conclusion, you're an android. Now, that would be a big kick in the pants to Rachel Rosen. Um, and at first, you know, it, <clears throat> it is presented as if it is, and this is a big catastrophe, right? So all these questions have evoked the responses of an android. And as it turns out, She's supposed to be a human. The elder Rosen said she's not an android. Um, and Rick says, I want a bone marrow test of you. And she says, well, I, you can't make me do that. Um, and Elden Rosen says, the issue is your empathy delineation test failed in response to my niece. I can explain why she scored as an android might. She grew up aboard Salander 3. She was born on it. She spent 14 of her 18 years living off its tape library and what the nine other crew members, all adults, knew about Earth. Then, as you know, the ship turned back a sixth of the way to Proxima, otherwise she'd never have seen Earth. And so, therefore, she doesn't have the normal reactions of a human being. And Rachel says, you would have retired me. In a police dragnet, I would have been killed. I've known that since I got here four years ago. This isn't the first time the Voight camp test has been given to me. In fact, I rarely leave this building because of the risk. Now, this then leads to you know, some discussions about moral matters you know, concerning the, this use of the Voight camp test. And um, Rosen says... Um, you're in a, a bad situation here. Your test doesn't actually work, and you could be, in fact, retiring you know, real human beings. Rick says, well, the problem is from your method of operation. Nobody forced your organization to evolve the production of human robots to the point where, and then he basically says, we're doing whatever the market wants. Your position, Mr. Deckard, is extremely bad morally, Ours isn't. And then Rick says, oh, I get it. This was to sideline me. You foisted off, as he says, this schizoid girl on me to flunk the test. And now I'm not going to get to try it out on any of your actual androids. And they go back and forth trying to bribe him with the owl. But then he recovers. He asks her one further question. Um, he says, I want to ask you one more question on the Voigtkamp scale, so sit down again. And she does. And he says, my briefcase. Nice, isn't it? Department issue. Well, well, Rachel said remotely. Baby hide, Rick said. He stroked the black leather surface of the briefcase. 100% genuine baby hide. He saw the two dial indicators gyrate frantically, but only after a pause. The reaction had come, but too late. He knew the reaction period down to a fraction of the second. The correct reaction period, there should have been none. Thanks, Miss Rosen, he concluded. He says, that's all. And then she says, what about the other nine subjects? And now here's the twist. The scale has been adequate in your case. I can extrapolate from that. It's clearly still effective. And he turns to, to Alden Rosen and he says, so, does she know? And um, Eldon says, no, we programmed her completely, but I think toward the end she suspected. You guessed when he asked for one more try. Pale Rachel nodded fixedly, and uh, you know they, they are now conceding that she is an android. As we're going to find out later in the book, this is kind of a sham. She does know that she's an android. So, you know, 
there's a lot of back and forth going on here and we get to see how the test works and what the implications of it are. Now, where else is the test being used in this? Um, it's being given to Luba Luft. And why to Luba Luft? Because legally you need to establish that she is an android before you can retire her. And we see, you know, here we go. He got out the Voigt Camp instruments. This is in chapter nine. And uh, he sets them up and she says, is this an IQ test? And he says, no, empathy. And so she says, do you think I'm an android? Is that it? I'm not an android. I've never been on Mars. I've never even seen an android. Um, do you have information that there's an android in the cast? I'd be glad to help you. And if I were an android, uh, were I, would I be glad to help you? And he says, well, an android doesn't care what happens to other androids. So yeah, you actually would be. And then interestingly, she turns this on him and she says, how do we know you're not an android? You know, if you could be an android uh, killer android and you would have the same sort of reactions as well. And she says, uh, have you taken this test? And he says, yes, a long time ago when I first started with the department. And she says, well, maybe that's a false memory. And she's doing everything she can to not take the test. She suggests that he should take it first. And then finally they, they get to it and she uses a strategy of obfuscation. She pretends not to understand the language and uh, everything else. So he says, uh, you're sitting watching TV, suddenly you discover a wasp crawling on your wrist. And she says, what's a wasp? A stinging bug that flies. Oh, how strange. Do they still exist? I've never seen one. So she's, she's doing all this chatter to avoid actually engaging with the test. And while he's trying to give the test, a police officer comes, uh, a harness bull, as he's called, and he takes Deckard to this fake police station where Deckard um, is being treated as if he's a suspect, uh, a, you know, a deranged killer, potentially an android himself. And when he's talking to Garland, um, he explains, um, you know, what's going on with this, this Voight Kampf test. Um, Garland, uh, uh, you know, uh, says, or the police official says, what do you have in here? And Deckard says, material pertaining to the Voight Camp personality test. I was testing a subject when Officer Crams arrested me. And they, they go on a little bit further. Uh, Rick says, you can administer the Voight Camp test to me. I've taken it before. I don't mind taking it again. And they say, listen, we don't have this test. Garland says, this Voight Kampf test you've mentioned, all that material you carry, it's an analytic tool for testing Andes. And Rick says, it's our basic test, the only one we currently employ, the only one capable of distinguishing the new Nexus 6 brain unit. You haven't heard of this test? And they say, well, I've heard of per several per profile analysis scales for use with androids, but not that one. Um, we actually use this, this other test. And as it turns out, Garland, is an android, right? And he doesn't get the test himself because he and Phil Resch have a little bit of a shootout. Phil Resch, however, who is going to help Deckard um, with Luba Luft, um, he's worried that perhaps he's an android. Deckard's not even sure whether Phil Resch is an android or not. And so they give Phil Resch the Voight Kampf test. And it turns out that Phil Resch is indeed human, which is good because he's got a pet squirrel who's dependent on him and he's, you know, uh, pretty well, uh, uh, you know, his mindset is that he is indeed human. And so it would be a real um, derangement to find out that he was an android. Deckard also self-administers the Voight Kampf test to himself with Phil Resch there. Why? so that he can test for something different, something that isn't typically tested for, namely whether or not he has empathy towards androids. So he does this, he gives himself a question. I'm going down by elevator with an android I've captured and suddenly someone kills it without warning no particular response, Phil Resch said. What did the needles hit? The left one, 2.8, the right one, 3.3. Rick said, this is to himself, a female android. 
Now they're up to 4.0 and 6, respectively. And Rick says, well, that's an emphatically empathetic response. So now I know by administering the Voight camp to myself that not only do I have empathy towards humans and towards animals, but also at least towards some androids. In a way, you could say that, that you know, what this is showing is that Rick is not just definitively human, but perhaps even more human in certain ways than, say, Phil Resch. So the test is used in a number of different ways throughout this, and it's, you know, it, it's uh, called into question whether it really is effective or not, and then you know, it's verified. Uh, but you know, as we see in that passage that we talked about before, it's probably just one of uh, you know, a whole succession of tests. It's, it's supplanted other tests, and it's probably going to fail down the line when the Nexus 7s come out, and then they'll have to develop some new way of figuring out who's human and who's not.